Okay, hi, I'm Luke Kerner, uh, VC with uh, Crypto Oracle and a co-host of Blockfin, and uh, excited to be sitting here with Kathleen and, uh, of Tezos, uh, one of the higher profile uh, projects around. And uh, so Kathleen, welcome, and why don't we start, uh, why don't you tell us about the genesis of Tezos? Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, so in 2014, the first real Cambrian explosion of so-called altcoins took place. And uh, fundamentally, people were really, really excited because they thought, oh, well, there's new innovations coming into this space, different uh, protocols for minor incentives, different things concerning privacy. Uh, but what frustrated me and my husband and our observation, which ultimately led to the, the beginning of Tezos, was that it was sort of silly that Bitcoin didn't have a way to fold in all these great innovations. Um, and how do you do that? Well, you provide a formal governance mechanism. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, Tezos, looks to have a blockchain with a governance mechanism to facilitate upgrades to the protocol. And it, what, what were you doing at the time where you came up with uh, uh, that thought? Oh, geez. Well, um, we'd been following the space for quite some time. Uh, one of our friends runs the cryptocurrency mailing list where Bitcoin was announced. <laughs> so, like, arguably, <laughs> we should have been into Bitcoin much earlier. Um, but, but essentially, uh, we'd been following the space and we'd been seeing some really good arguments for Bitcoin, some really bad arguments for Bitcoin. Um, but in 2014, that really drew to a head with uh, the, the first altcoin explosion. But uh, my husband was working in finance. Um, I was working in finance. Uh, we saw a lot of people very interested in like the momentum around Bitcoin, but very few people who really wanted to understand what its limitations were. And so, can you talk about the consensus mechanism, the governance? Sure. Yeah. So one of the observations that's made in the first Tesla's position paper is that miners don't necessarily always have the same incentives as token holders in order to uh, to upgrade the protocol. That's like one of the big tensions that we explore. And one way to resolve this is to give um, token holders the same role as miners in validating the ledger, validating the chain. Um, and so we, we came up with this mechanism for delegated proof of stake whereby uh, miners and token holders kind of assume the same role. And what's more, you can actually, um, you, you can actually delegate this responsibility to someone else who might want to run the software and they would benefit from the inflationary mechanism uh, maintained to validate the ledger. And so can you talk about how the proof of stake works? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, you run a specialized piece of software and you're asked to, uh, to, to mint a block and, and become part of the transaction um, history. And, and what facilitates this is an inflationary mechanism, right? Uh, so we're targeting around 5% per year um, in order to do that in the first iteration. And you can either become a delegate and run the software yourself, um, or you can give that responsibility to someone else who will benefit from the inflationary mechanism. And I think one of the interesting things, too, is, is you have a penalty mechanism for the bad actors. Yes, yeah, so you have to post a bond. So you have to have a certain number of tokens in order to participate in this. And that just kind of makes sense. You should have skin in the game if you're participating in it. And if you start to, uh, if you start to do any funny business, the network can detect it and actually penalize you very literally and, and slash and take your security deposit. And it, so you, you started writing about this in 2014. Uh, so I, I, I assume your thinking has evolved a bit since then. Well, I think we got a lot of things right. We got a lot of, we overstated our, our position on Bitcoin a little bit too much, frankly. Like uh, the Tezos position paper sort of reads like a gloom and doom story of Bitcoin. And clearly it's much more resilient than we ever gave it credit for. Um, but I think what's been interesting to see how uh, some, some of the things that were the most taxing to develop in the past four years um, are really what we're most proud of and what's rendered the the most optimistic uh, outlook on Tezos. So a focus on formal methods, a focus on, um, Safe, safe typing, so on and so forth, are really what's going to yield dividends in the future. And uh, you know, we probably could have, we probably could have launched this with proof of work pretty early on, um, but really making sure that the proof of stake algorithm was uh, tight and concise uh, was one of the biggest research areas for the past few years. And can you talk about? So now you're starting to get close to the rollout. Yeah, yeah. So the Tezos Foundation is responsible for actually um, launching the Genesis block and and. Uh, doing all that fun stuff. And at this point, it's more of an operational hassle than anything else. So as I mentioned before, you've got this notion of delegates in the system and a proof of stake algorithm. You really have to have um, strong participation from the network. And that's a tension between um, finding people who want to do that <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and making it easy for them at the same time. Uh, so I know the foundation has uh, funded a team in New York that's going to be working on making baking or staking, uh, validating the ledger easier, uh, for example. And can you talk, you know, one of the things that uh, Melton was up here talking about that I thought was really interesting uh, was about, um, you know, how these ecosystems are now funding companies that are building in their yeah. ecosystems. Can you talk about Tezos' plans there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the Tezos Foundation was endowed with around $232 million in July of last year. 
Um, that number, thanks to the price of Bitcoin going higher, is, is closer to like 800 million or something in that order of magnitude. Um, so they have a lot of money essentially to endow uh, the Tezos ecosystem, which is their legal mandate, uh, which is great, right? Um, that's wonderful because you can, you can skin a lot of cats that way. Um, but one of the first ideas that we, we, we kind of had in conjunction with uh, Johan at the time was to do a, a venture fund, right? And kind of, uh, kind of have this wave, this mechanism for people to um, pledge money towards projects that they thought were interesting. Um, but what's nice about Tezos is that it doesn't actually need that sort of infrastructure um, because if you submit an upgrade to the protocol, um, you can actually attach an invoice. So there's a, way to, um, there's a way to compensate and reward people who actually <laughs> add value to the network, um, either through uh, seeking venture funding or some sort of grant making activity from the foundation or to just go off and do their own thing, submit it to the network and, and uh, receive an invoice for that. So you will be, so you, you're not gonna be doing that or? Oh, I think they are, yes. Um, you know, I, I, part of the arrangement is that I don't work for the foundation, <laughs> um, so I can go off and do my own thing. Um, either way, I'll certainly be investing in projects that I think add to the ecosystem. Uh, things that we're really excited about are things like ZK Snarks, uh, ZK Snarks, the next iteration. Um, I also, I, I think and what about that, because that's obviously one of the more interesting emerging technologies. So what are you excited about ZK Snarks? And why don't you explain to the audience just in case there's anybody there not familiar with it? Yeah, exactly. So um, ZK Snarks are essentially what makes uh, Zcash private, right? It's a way to obfuscate transactions and, and make it difficult to um, trace the record of who owns what in a, in a ledger. Um, what's also interesting from our perspective is that it's also a way to condense the protocol and to, uh, to, to make it easier to digest and inspect. Um, so compression is the virtue that we see there. So I think scalability is kind of this, this big behemoth mass and, and it's worth looking at all different sorts of ways to, uh, ways to approach it and I think Starks are one of the most promising. And what are the other technologies you'd be interested in funding? Yeah, so I mean, more on the business side, I think uh, the private secondaries market is ripe for destruction. Um, I think I'd like to focus on that and see how blockchain technology can help. Um, I think that's kind of been the promise of quote unquote, you know, <laughs> private blockchain companies, like let's see if we can do it on a public chain. Um, obviously that necessitates a bit more development and scalability and uh, you know, a bit more guidance from the regulators, um, but I think it's entirely possible. And can you talk a bit about the, the, the Tezos community? I mean, obviously you had an incredibly engaged community, um, obviously, you know, massively successful raise. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are really, you know, love Tezos. Um, so can you talk about kind of how you're engaging the community, the different things that, that the community is up for, and also, you know, what can you teach others uh, about growing a community? Yeah, so Tezos seems to elicit very strong feelings, <laughs> which is both good and bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th around 30,000 people opened up wallets in the fundraiser, which I think is awesome. My hometown of Fairlawn, New Jersey has 30,000 people in it, so it's like <laughs> a number that I can easily, you know, kind of get the sense of, of breath on. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, what helps bring a community together is a, a common, uh, a, a common uh, <laughs> goal. Um, most recently, that was, you know, uh, helping the foundation get back on its feet. Um, it seemed to bring out a lot of people out of the woodwork, um, for better or worse. Um, but I think in general, giving people a voice in the protocol is really what um, seems to attract a lot of folks to the project. It doesn't feel futile to just opine on things. You can actually present them. And there's a mechanism by which their voice can very literally be heard. It's not just a matter of uh, changing your Twitter handle in order to show <laughs> support for one side or another. Can you talk about what you've learned about community you know, since, since the raise and you know, again, how you're addressing community differently than you were before? Yeah. Again, I mean, it's really one of the things, obviously, that's different about crypto than, than the rest of the world. Oh, most definitely. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of personalities that come to the table with, with uh, the crypto <laughs> ecosystem, like for better or worse, right? Um, I think what I've taken away from is that you can trust other people. <laughs> um, I think, you know, this started off as a hobbyist project between um, Arthur, myself, and a handful of developers, and we kind of kept that mentality through the fundraiser. Um, you know, essentially, like, we, we were just so used to being such a small team. Um, but what's nice about having such a, a wide distribution of folks who are interested in the project is that you get to, like, you get to garner a lot of talents, right? Um, so things like baking, uh, we, we or, uh, you know, running the, learning the validator nodes, if you will. Um, in Tezos, we call it baking because all of our developers are French, um, and it's an, <laughs> it's an homage, if you will. But um, <laughs> I, I digress. Uh, yeah, so like baking, for example, like we, we kind of thought that it would be this thing that the developers would have to in take it incumbent upon themselves to explain to people, so on and so forth. But almost as, as quickly as the, um, 
you know, network uh, was preparing for launch, we found that all these people were making great documentation, and it was it, wow. excellent, right? Um, and I think what's, what's kind of been nice is to observe the emergent order uh, that people kind of coordinate amongst themselves uh, once you start to give them any sort of license to participate in the development of an ecosystem. Wow, really interesting. It's amazing how fast 10 minutes goes, but thank right. you very no, much. Well, thank you. <laughs>